Okay, welcome back everybody. So, um, I wanted to uh, talk about what we had kind of finished with yesterday, which is, um, let's say uh, I have uh, our kind of typical homogeneous linear system like this. Right. A lot of times you'll see this written, um, you know, as x prime is equal to ax, however you want to look at that, um, with maybe an initial condition, so uh, maybe x uh, of 0 is equal to x sub i. Okay, but this is the thing, the central object of study, and kind of what we've been doing for the last couple of lectures uh, and what we're going to be focusing on um, for, uh, uh, for, for a few more lectures. So anyway, um, notice, right, like, and you may have already seen this just based on what I've already done. Um, looking at this thing, this evokes a kind of uh, familiarity from the first order case. In fact, if I kind of forget for a second that, of course, this x is a solution vector, this a is a matrix, right? If I'm just kind of thinking formally about this, or maybe even superficially, about how this looks, what does this remind you of? Um, this reminds you of an equation like this, right? It reminds you of this thing, right? Okay. So it reminds you of, of that thing. Hmm. Okay. And what was the what was the solution to this? Right? So here's my first order equation like this. The solution to this is Y of T is what? It's E to the A T. Right? You can just check, of course, dy dt is a e to the at, so that's a y, right? This was the first, you know, non-explicit uh, differential equation that we even solved in this course, right? This was kind of the, the first, our first stepping stone to solving any kind of differential equation was this thing. Right, and so this was the solution, okay? Well, um, here, of course, we're treating this big A as if it was just a constant, right? But um, that's not quite what's going on here. This A is a matrix, right? So then um, the question, does it make sense to seek a solution? to star in the form uh, e to the t a, right, where a is a matrix, of course. So does it make sense to, and I've rewritten it in this particular way just to match the notation um, of the of the notes, um, but you know, in the the spirit of this is the same as this. I just wrote it, uh, I just wrote it like this. So um, the question is, uh, does it make sense to seek a solution to this thing that has this form, okay, where A is some matrix, and the answer is yes. Uh, this is known as a matrix exponential. So this is known as a matrix exponential. Now, to actually define matrix exponential, we are going to we are going to take our time here and okay well let's suppose right I got to get the setting right so suppose that this is the equation in question ok 
Okay, there is my system that I'm solving. Okay, so A is a constant matrix, so A is this coefficient matrix, A is constant, so it does not depend on T, it's N by N, it's real. So all the entries are real, it's an N by N matrix, it's constant. Okay, define Big phi of T is the natural fundamental matrix for star if. Now, yesterday we defined the fundamental matrix, right? So it was basically, if we had found a fundamental solution set, if we'd found a fundamental solution set uh, for this equation, then the fundamental matrix was just the matrix whose columns were each of those solutions in that fundamental solution set. Okay, This is the fundamental matrix. The thing we're defining now is called the natural fundamental matrix. This is different, but we're going to see how they're related. Okay, so we will see... Uh, how these two things are related um, and and why we're making a distinction here. Basically the natural fundamental matrix is just a little bit nicer um, and we'll see explicitly what I mean uh, by this once we have all the tools. So um, anyway, this is the natural fundamental matrix for star. Uh, if it solves the uh, matrix IVP which is big phi prime. So phi is something that depends on t. So big phi prime, this prime is with respect to t, is equal to a times phi. So this is matrix multiplication now. This was matrix multiplication as well. It's just that x is a vector. Now both a and phi are matrices of the same size. And my initial condition on this matrix is that this is equal to the n by n identity matrix. Let's do a quick aside here. Okay, so let's do a quick aside since I don't think I've actually defined the identity matrix. So if A is just some n by n matrix, the n by n identity matrix is defined to be the matrix that has ones on its main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. All that's zero. All those are zero. So basically what this means is that this is the matrix such that uh, you know A sub II is equal to one for all I between one and N. And a sub i j is equal to zero for all i not equal to j. So this is the identity matrix. So when you're on the diagonal, so all the 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, and all the way down to n, n entries are all 1. But uh, a sub i j is zero if i and j are not equal to each other. So this is the matrix I get. Why is this called the identity? Well, um, if you multiply any matrix by the identity on either side, you get the matrix you started with. So the identity matrix actually commutes with every other matrix, right? That's rare for matrices, right? Typically matrix multiplication does not commute. In this case it does, and actually even better than that, this thing is acting as multiplication by one. If you don't believe me, right, let's do a quick example. Let uh, A be the two by two matrix A, B, C, D, and let I be the two by two identity, right, which is one, zero, zero, one. There it is. Okay, then what is A times I? Well, that's A, B, C, D times the two by two identity, one, zero, zero, one, which is, let's do our matrix multiplication practice. 
I take the row AB and transpose it and dot it with the column 1, 0. So this is A times 1 plus B times 0. So that's, oh, <laughs> this is A. All right. Um, the entry in the first row, second column, is I dot the first row uh, AB with the second column 0, 1. So A times 0 plus B times 1. So that's B. Next, I dot the second row with the first column, so C times 1 plus D times 0, so that's C. And I dot the second row with the second column, so C times 0 D plus, uh, plus D times 1, so that's D. Hey, that's A. Right. Okay, so that's how multiplying by the identity works. Okay, now we introduce the identity here as this is actually my initial matrix for this matrix IVP. Okay, so I is the n by n identity matrix. Okay, so this is a matrix differential equation. We haven't seen this before. We're not going to worry too, too much about this because primarily we're just using this to identify or to define phi and to get some properties of of phi here. Okay, so since A is constant, phi has some nice properties. These properties are going to inform us that, oh, this thing is behaving like an exponential. So what are these properties? So one, it's that if you have phi of t plus s, this is the same thing as phi of t times phi of s. Okay, and this is true for every t and s real, right? So any real numbers t and s, this is true. This is an amazing property, and I'll explain in a second. Secondly, phi of t times phi of minus t, well, this would be phi of zero, which is the identity, right? For all t and r. Why? Because this, by the first property, is phi of t minus t, so phi of zero, and phi of zero by this initial condition is i. Okay. Okay, now, why are these amazing? So these are amazing properties. Uh, let's focus on the first one. What is nice about this? So first of all, you notice that this definitely is reminiscent of exponential behavior. What do I mean? Well, if I think of you know, e to the t plus s, that's e to the t times e to the s, this behavior of taking addition and turning it into multiplication, that is something that exponential functions do, right? That's one of the key exponential properties, right, that leads to all these nice things that you're, that you're used to. Um, okay, so, um, you know, another thing that this says is, of course, I could have done this, this, uh, multiplication either order. So I could have this written as phi of s times phi of t. This would be phi of s plus t, but s plus t and t plus s are the same thing. So phi of t times phi of s is equal to phi of s times phi of t. So these things commute, right? Phi commutes. Phi of t and phi of s commute with each other. That's amazing because in general for matrix multiplication, you know, you do not have commutativity. So if you can find, you know, some matrices that actually commute with one another, you can actually multiply them in any order. That's, that's a very nice uh, thing. And that's not a common thing. So this is definitely something special. Okay. So um, let's define the matrix exponential. So definition, the matrix exponential for star is uh, the matrix valued, or I should say, is the natural fundamental matrix. Is 
the natural fundamental matrix big phi of t above. We denote this Instead of using phi, we denote this by E to the TA. Now, let's notice something here. Using this definition, right, note we can check that the derivative of this matrix exponential e to the ta is what? Well, it turns out that this is a e to the ta, right? or a times x, if that's what you're concerned with. Maybe I should just leave it as a e to the ta. And e to the ta evaluated at t equals 0 is the identity. So this thing is really behaving like an exponential, right? Well, but why is this the case? This is the case because it solves this matrix differential equation. So this is by definition of the way that we've written this. I.e., so note, if E and TA is the matrix exponential of the linear system x prime is equal to ax and x naught is equal to x sub i then I actually have something really really nice happening where then the general solution to this equation. So forget about the initial condition for a second. Then the general solution to this equation is x of t is equal to e to the ta times c where c is my vector of arbitrary constants And specifically, since I know that this is the identity, and I know that this is equal to x sub i, and also, since x is 0 is equal to x sub i, the unique solution is x of t is equal to matrix exponential e to the ta, times x sub i. So if I have a matrix exponential for a given problem at my fingertips, then I can immediately write the general solution as e to the ta times c, or the unique solution imposing this initial condition is e to the ta times that initial vector x sub i. Okay. So I have reduced this entire process to finding a matrix exponential. Thus, I have reduced this entire process to computing a matrix exponential. e to the ta. What process? This entire process, what does that mean for solving the equation x prime is equal to ax? Okay. So, that last page just told me that if I want to solve this sort of thing, 
if I want to solve this sort of thing, then uh, I will um, I will be done, right? That there will be nothing left to do if I can actually find a matrix exponential for this problem. Okay. Now this is cheating just a little bit because, of course, if you pay attention to how the definition of the matrix exponential is, it actually solves a similar matrix differential equation. It doesn't really seem like solving that matrix differential equation is actually any easier. In fact, it kind of seems like the same thing or possibly even harder. But um, the point is I've recast this whole thing as finding a matrix exponential. Um, this is going to be useful for us because we are going to see so the notes covers multiple methods of doing this, at least three methods of doing this. I'm going to focus mostly on one of them. And I see there's a question in chat. Will I send more information about the MATLAB? Uh, yes. Yes, I will type that into chat. So yeah, I'll do that uh, later today. I meant to do that like a couple days ago and, and forgot. I, basically what I'm going to do is make the MATLAB deadlines more flexible. So um, I'm not going to change the deadline, but if you need a few extra days uh, to turn it in, then that's fine, and I'll let the grader uh, know that uh, not to not to dock you any points there. I'm going to post your second MATLAB project soon, the end of this week, Friday, and it will be due. Um, it will be due the following Friday, or maybe even the following Sunday, just to just to give you all time uh, to do that. So anyway, that's the. Uh, that is the deal, uh, and I'll let you all know um, about that. Also, uh, more info. Uh, uh, some people had asked about, you know, good ways to access MATLAB, and I'll I'll include that in my little uh, in the little blurb that I send out. So anyway, um, yeah, you can be looking forward to that. I will I will send that out a bit later today. Um, okay. So anyway, um, as I said, maybe this is cheating a little bit. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I have just reformulated what it is I'm looking for, um, and I've reformulated it in terms of finding a matrix exponential. So the big question is, how do I do this? How do I find? How do I compute E to the TA for a given problem? X prime is equal to AX. Okay, now as I said, the textbook or the notes, so our notes cover three methods. Okay, so um, the methods are uh, computing a natural fundamental uh, solution set. There's one method that will uh, that that will do that. There's the Green's function method. Um, and there's the Eigen methods. Okay, we are going to focus we are going to focus on Eigen methods. Okay. So, um, as I said, there's a couple of other methods to do this other than Eigen methods. Which one is the easiest really depends on what kind of info you've been given. So I can cook up problems that would make Eigen methods not the preferred way of doing this, um, but typically, um, you know, in in this course, Eigen methods are going to do more for us than the other two. Um, so that's uh, that's the that's the deal. Um, so we're going to primarily be focusing on Eigen methods. But before I can do that and see what it is that's going on here, um, I have to define a few things. So before we can get to the heart of eigenmethods, we need some more background. Okay, so we need some more background. So this is more kind of, I'll call it supplemental stuff, but actually it's not, some of it is in the supplemental chapter, but most of it is actually in the main chapter section for eigenmethods. 
So let's uh, have a look at at what these things um, uh, at what these things are. So first of all, uh, the notion of an inverse. So for these problems, let's just assume that the matrix in question is always a square matrix, an n by n matrix. In this course, that's all we're going to talk about. So before I was kind of giving you the general rundown on matrix algebra, but um, you know where you have a rectangular matrix and m by n matrix, uh, but everything we're going to deal with is going to be a square matrix. Okay, so um, there is the question of whether or not A is invertible. So is A invertible? That is a central question in linear algebra. Is A invertible, i.e., does A inverse exist? What do I mean by this? Does A inverse exist? What does that question even mean? Well, it means does there exist a matrix called A inverse such that a times A inverse is equal to the identity matrix. If these are both n by n matrix matrices, then a product of two n by n matrices would be an n by n matrix. So it, I want to find a matrix A inverse such that A times A inverse is equal to the identity. Does this exist? Um, the answer is, well, not always, right? So this does not always exist. This does not always exist. Okay, so an example. If A is equal to the matrix like 1, 0, 0, 0, okay, has no inverse. Okay. Now, why does this have no inverse? Or how can I tell that a matrix has no inverse? So there's a big fact here. You may have wondered, where does the determinant come from? Where does that weird alternating sum thing come from? Um, well, uh, it was discovered uh, as the single thing, the single quantity that determines whether or not a matrix has an inverse. So A inverse exists if and only if determinant of A is non-zero. Ah. And so this ties together all of the stuff that we've used about determinants being non-zero, right? Remember, the Ronskian itself is a determinant. Okay, so Ronskian being non-zero is saying a determinant of some type is non-zero. Okay, and saying a determinant is non-zero has something to do with invertibility, right? Namely, it, I mean, it just tells you whether the matrix in question has an inverse. So the determinant being non-zero tells you this has, an, this has an inverse. So if we go back to this example, what's the determinant of A? Well, if you believe me that this doesn't have an inverse, this has to be 0, but let's just check. This is 1 times 0 minus 0 times 0. Yeah, that's 0. Okay, now the question is how do I find A inverse? Right, so how do I find A inverse? Well, there's usually a very annoying process uh, where what I would do is technically I would take my matrix A and I would stick it in a bigger matrix and then next to it I would take the identity matrix of the same size stick it in the same matrix then I would do row operations so elementary row operations if you're not familiar with those these are basically the things that you're allowed to do to systems of equations systems of linear equations so you can swap the order of the rows. You can multiply a row by a constant, right, by some scalar that's non-zero. You can multiply, uh, or sorry, you can do row replacement, which means you can multiply a row by a scalar and then add it to another row replacing that row. Okay, that's another row operation. And those are the three elementary row operations. So this is the process of row reduction or putting this into reduce row echelon form. If you already know that A inverse exists, then this process always terminates in something that looks like this. So you put it in reduce row echelon form. On the left now will be the identity matrix. And on the right, whatever matrix this is will be A, A inverse. So that's how you would do this by hand for like a 3x3, three 4x4, three, four four, whatever, for a larger matrix. That's how you would find a inverse. So for a big matrix, this could be pretty annoying. Um, 
so is there a better way? <laughs> um, there's something called the adjugate um, or classical adjoint uh, uh, form for an inverse that can be nicer in some sense um, for computing the inverse of a matrix because it computes the inverse of a matrix like entry by entry but um, for a two by two case this is easy right so for two by two case this is easier so let's see how that works all right maybe you don't remember how this goes so here's a very important fact if a is the 2 by 2 matrix that we're calling a b c d okay then a inverse is 1 over the determinant of a times the matrix so the way that this works is that the main diagonal this is how to remember this the main diagonal entries get swapped so a becomes D and D becomes a and the off diagonal entries get negated so this becomes minus B and minus C rewriting this because now one first of all you see why determinant of a has to be non-zero because if it's not non-zero then you're dividing by zero here right this is the only thing in this formula that can possibly go wrong is if that determinant is zero so uh, a way of writing this purely in terms of a b c and d is uh, this is one over a d minus b c times the matrix d minus b minus c a and you should just remember this okay so for two by two this is your formula for uh, for the inverse so it's really really nice so you should just remember this okay um, all right so we can check of course that this works so just check all right let's check this way this is just more practice so a times a inverse what is that I can go ahead and pull that constant out so this is 1 over uh, a D minus B C times the matrix a B C D times the matrix uh, D minus B minus C A. All right, so let's see, what is this? This is 1 over A D minus B C times matrix. So let's just do this entry by entry. So then this would be um, A times D plus B times minus C. This is A D minus B C. In this entry, I get A times minus B, so minus A B plus B times A. In this entry I would have C times D plus D times minus C. So this would be C D minus D C. And lastly here uh, in second row second column I would get C times minus B. So minus B C uh, plus A D. Right. And so what is this? Well these are 0, these are AD minus BC, AD minus BC, so dividing by AD minus BC I get 1, 0, 0, 1, which is exactly the identity, right, the 2 by 2 identity, so, yep, that works, right, that's the thing that always works here. Okay, so there's my 2 by 2. All right, let me get more paper. I'm getting a little low. All right. Okay, a couple more things. Um, so for instance, if A is the N by N matrix, maybe it looks something like this. Right, A to one all the way down to a uh, n one this would be a two two all over to a two n this would be all the way down to a n two and this would be all the way over to a n n there's my matrix a the trace of 
square matrix A is trace of A, which is the sum of its diagonal entries. And so on, all the way out to A and N. So, if A is the 3 by 3 matrix, 1, minus 1, 7, uh, 2, 2, 4, 10, 7, 3, then the trace of A is the sum of the diagonal entries 1 plus 2 plus 3. So 6. Okay. All right. So now, what else do I want to talk about in terms of matrix algebra stuff? So the next thing is uh, I want to talk about plugging a matrix into a polynomial. So uh, let's say that I have a polynomial, say P of Z, and I write that as um, like A naught plus A1Z plus A2Z squared all the way out to ANZ to the N. Okay. What does it mean to plug in a matrix into this polynomial. So you could just do the like stupid thing and just say, well, I just replace Z with A, right? So I would have A naught plus um, A1 times A plus uh, A2 times A squared and so on, all the way out to A uh, to the, or sorry, A sub N times A to the N. Okay, but does this actually make sense, right? So, if I plug in a matrix into this polynomial, what should the result be, right? Like if I plug in, say, a, a real number here, the result here is going to be a real number. Right. If I plug in a matrix A, the result here should be, I would hope, a matrix. Now, if we check these terms, so this is a constant times a matrix times itself n times, right? So A times A times A times A, that makes sense. That's, of course, a little hard to compute, and I'll talk about that in a second. But this at least makes sense, right? This would just be A times A times A a bunch of times times A. That would be A to the N, for instance, right? It makes sense to multiply a matrix by itself a bunch. You get a matrix out of it. That's A to the N. And then constant times a matrix is definitely a matrix. Well, we're doing that in every single term, right? Constant times a matrix squared, so A times A. Constant times a matrix. All these are matrices. Adding matrices of the exact same size, also a matrix. Um, but here, this constant term, I'm adding to a matrix, but for matrix addition to make sense, right, if I'm going to add two matrices, they actually have to be of the exact same size. So if they're n by n matrices, they're square matrices, then both of them have to be n by n matrices, or it just doesn't work. There's no way to do it. So here, that's not what I have, right? Here, that's not what I have. So to make this make sense, right, because it doesn't make sense to add a constant to a matrix, I have to throw in the identity matrix here to make this thing actually equal to the thing that it should be, right, the thing that makes sense. Okay. Hmm. Okay. 
So this is what it means to plug a matrix into a polynomial. I have to add in this little I here. Okay. All right, we're getting we're getting closer. Okay, all of it's going to start coming together soon. So a quick note. A to the K is not easy to compute from A itself. So for instance, you might think, right, that if I have, uh, here, let me say, if this, if A is equal to A, B, C, D, right, maybe you hope that A squared is equal to a squared, b squared, c squared, d squared. Maybe that's your hope. Uh, but it's not true. So it doesn't work like that. And if you want to see why it doesn't work, just do a times a here, right? So a times a is going to be, uh, I'll just write it so that it makes it easy to see the multiplication we have to do. Okay, so what, what is this? This is going to be uh, a times a, so that's a squared, plus b times c. In the next slot, it's going to be a times b plus b times d. In the next slot, it's going to be c times a plus d times c. In the last slot, it's going to be c times b plus d squared. So this is not even close to this, right? This is something you would not maybe have predicted just looking at A. But A squared is exactly just A times A, and it doesn't work out this nicely, right? So computing A to the K for a matrix, given matrix A, is just not something that's that easy to, to do, okay? All right, um, so this takes effort. In fact, this is the thing that motivates our development of eigenvalues, okay? So understanding or trying to understand A to the K leads us to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. These are going to be the central objects of interest when it comes to Eigen methods. Okay. Now I'll define what this is here in just a second. Okay. But this is this is our motivation for um, uh, for developing eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Okay. So um, we'll see that this is going to allow us to talk about iterative processes uh, because like w you might ask the question why do I care to understand a to the k for maybe some k that's pretty large like a to the 1000 or something why do I care um, so it turns out that there's a lot of processes that uh, that can be modeled by matrix multiplication um, and they can be done in such a way that you start with an initial vector say x sub i and you take this as your n equals zero, your initial time step. And to go to the next time step, you iterate the process by multiplying by a model matrix A. So this is the n equals one time step. And then to progress to the next time step, you would multiply by A again. So you take the matrix or the vector you got from this step and multiply that by a. So this would be a times a times xi. This is the n equals 2 times step. But by associativity of matrix multiplication, this is a squared times x sub i. And then to go to the next time step, right, and so on, to go to the kth time step, you would have a to the k times x sub i. That's the n equals k time step. Okay. And so Basically, understanding how to figure out what the behavior of A to the K is like for, say, K large, 
is important because that's essentially you figuring out how this process works, right? And there's a lot, there's a ton of processes that can be um, modeled in this way. Okay, so that's why this is important um, to do. And the notice, or the thing that, that you notice here is that while it's true in general that a to the k is not easy to compute, for some a's it is. Right? So, for instance, if a is equal to, we'll say a 0, 0, 0, b 0, 0, 0, c, you can just check this on your own, then a to the k is a to the k, 0, 0, 0, b to the k, 0, 0, 0, c to the k. So, while in general, a to the k does not work out the way that you maybe hope that it would, if a is a very special kind of matrix, it actually does. It works out exactly like this. This is called a diagonal matrix. So what is a diagonal matrix? A diagonal matrix is one that has no, uh, zero entries everywhere, except on the diagonal you can have non-zero entries. Okay, The diagonal entries can also be zero, they don't need to be non-zero, but um, um, it is a matrix so that the only possible non-zero terms would happen on the diagonal. Okay, so for a diagonal matrix it's really really easy to compute this, uh, these powers of matrices. This leads us to a process known as diagonalization. Okay, so to take a matrix and find another matrix that is similar to it that is diagonal. Okay, um, and so that process requires eigenval eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, that's, that's how you diagonalize a matrix. So that's where these, these come in. Now we're gonna, there's another intuitive way of thinking about eigenvectors and eigenvalues that I'll get into here in a second. But before that, I also wanted to mention another thing that cannot be easily computed, which you may have figured this out, right? So if you have a matrix A, right? And again, we'll just say, what if A is a simple two by two matrix A, B, C, D? The matrix exponential, you might have asked yourself, well, is this not just like e to the t a, e to the t b, e to the t c, and e to the t d? Is that the case? I mean, if that's the case, then we don't need those three methods I mentioned. We don't need eigenmethods. We can just do this, right? This is easy enough. Uh, no, this is not going to be even close to true. Um, this is just not how this works out um, at all. Okay. So this is this is not how it goes. If if that was how it how it went, we would not have to put so much effort into computing these things, right? We would just write our thing down and be be happy. But that's not this is not how it works. Okay. So this brings us to finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix A. Now, um, I'll define these things for an n by n matrix. Uh, and it, if you take 240 or 461, you will be finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors for matrices that are larger than a 2 by 2. But for this course, um, practically speaking, this analysis is only going to applied to two by two matrices because it's um, too much effort to do what's required to do this for larger matrices. But I'm just letting you know that you could do it for larger matrices. It's just slightly more tedious. Okay. And so how does this work? Um, so first of all, I have to define what an eigenvalue and eigenvector is. So here's my idea. I want to know when and for what vectors multiplying by a matrix A 
acts like multiplication by a number lambda. Now I've specifically used the word number here, okay? I didn't say scalar or constant because typically when I say scalar or constant, the thing that pops into your head is a real number. The reason I left number here uh, as being something ambiguous is that sometimes it will make sense for this number to be a complex number, okay? So, um, and you know, you might say, wait, what? How? Complex number, right? Like uh, everything, you know, all my matrices are supposed to be real, they're supposed to have real entries, so why are you allowing complex numbers here? You'll see. You probably can already guess what, uh, where the complex numbers come in. They come in in the exact same place they always come in, uh, right? So in every <laughs> previous math class you've ever had, where did complex numbers show up? Well, as roots of polynomials, right? Because unfortunately, it's very unfortunate, well, not really, but it's unfortunate if you had a hope for complex numbers to not show up, um, that even for the simplest possible polynomials, right? X squared plus one, right? That has complex roots. There's no getting around it. So uh, there's really no, no restriction you can reasonably make on a polynomial, right, that is going to get rid of those, right? There's just too many polynomials that have complex roots. So that's, so that's that, okay. All right, so uh, I want to know when multiplying by matrix A acts like mul multiplication by a number we'll call lambda. So IE, I want to find all vectors V and numbers lambda such that a times the vector v is equal to lambda times the vector v. So this is what I mean by a acting like multiplication. Okay. So a acts like multiplication by a number if a times the vector v is equal to lambda that number times v. Okay. Hmm. 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 Interesting. All right. So here's the here's the big question: Is what does this mean for a matrix A? Well, first of all, how can I how can I have a hope of, of finding this right? Let's give names to these things. So, such a lambda is called an eigenvalue of A. And such a V is called an eigenvector of A associated to the eigenvalue lambda. So a couple of conceptual things here. So it makes sense to talk about an eigenvalue of a matrix without reference to an eigenvector. You could say 3 is the, the eigenvalue for some matrix. Okay, 17 is an eigenvalue for the matrix. i is an eigenvalue for the matrix. Minus square root of pi is an eigenvalue for the matrix. All those make sense. Okay. Um, but when you talk about an eigenvector, you can say it's an eigenvector for the, for the matrix, but always hiding in the background is that it's an eigenvector for an eigenvalue. So it's an eigenvector associated to an eigenvalue. So these things come in a pair. There is an eigenvalue and then there's eigenvectors associated to it. Now it turns out there's infinitely many and I'll give you a quick proof of that in a second. But um, if I write these things as a pair, if I think about them as being associated, this is known as an eigenpair of A. OK. 
Okay, so this is an eigenpair of A. All right. So, um, here's a couple of things. Note, if lambda v is an eigenpair of A, then CV for some scalar C is an eigenvector associated to lambda for A as well. So let's just check. Well, um, let's check what is A times CV. Well, you can pull constants out of matrix vector multiplication. So this is C times AV. But since lambda V is an eigenpair of A, AV is lambda V. So this is C times lambda V. But now I can move this scalar multiplication back in. So this is lambda times CV. And so I have a vector CV such that A times CV is equal to lambda times CV. So CV is an eigenvector associated to lambda for A. So, what this tells you is that, in general, there are infinitely many eigenvectors associated to an eigenvalue lambda of A. Now, by convention, zero is not considered to be um, an eigenvector. Okay, so we don't we don't talk about uh, zero as an eigenvector, um, but um, and that's that's just to tidy some things up conceptually. It would it would be stupid because zero would technically be an eigenvector for like every number, even not non eigenvalues. So anyway, we don't talk about that. Um, so zero is not an eigenvector. Uh, so. By convention, the zero vector is not an eigenvector for anything. Okay, so this clears up some confusion that can arise from this stuff. Okay, now the big question is how do I find eigenvalues and eigenvectors? This is obviously given a matrix A. Okay, so finding eigenvalues is in a sense a little bit more straightforward. Finding eigenvectors associated with those eigenvalues takes a little bit more work, and I'm going to give you two different methods for doing this. Okay, um, so, uh, and, and I'm going to give you two different methods, and the, uh, you can use either of those methods, it doesn't matter uh, which. So if you learned how to do this from 240 or 461, or in any other place, you can feel free to continue doing it by, by that method, just the usual method, I'll call it. Um, but uh, in our context, since we're only going to be worrying about 2 by 2s there is a particularly nice theorem we can use called the Cayley-Hamilton theorem uh, that I might not get to today. But um, it's called the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, and um, it allows you to sidestep um, the usual process ever so slightly and make it a little bit more direct. Now, because we're doing this mostly for 2x2s, two it's not going to save you a ton of time. So if you don't get it, 
then you don't have to use it. You can just do the normal uh, thing that you've always done for finding eigenvectors. Okay. All right. And the answer is that the first step is first step is to define the characteristic polynomial. A, I've heard of that before. But now this is not the characteristic polynomial of a differential operator. This is the characteristic polynomial of A, a matrix. Okay. So let's see what it is we're doing here. So if lambda and V is an eigenpair for a matrix A, then this is what this means. So this means lambda V is an eigenpair of A. Okay. Well, let's rewrite this. This is uh, AV minus lambda V is equal to the zero vector. Factoring out here. Um, actually, I'm going to see, does your does your notes that's the question how do your notes okay your notes defines the characteristic polynomial as as the backwards thing maybe I should subtract in the other direction I actually don't care here um, <clears throat> so actually yeah uh, it, it doesn't matter which way I do this but uh, I'll, I'll do it in the other direction so uh, I'll I'll subtract in the other direction just to stay consistent with the notes so uh, we'll do lambda v minus a v is equal to the zero vector now I want to factor out a v here right but and you might be tempted to write this you might be tempted to write lambda minus a times v is equal to the zero vector and say yeah I can go from here to here and factor out v like that but why can't I do this? Well, what's in parentheses here? Lambda, which is a number, right? Forget about it, it, the, it possibly being complex. Say it's just a real number, right? I have three minus a matrix. That doesn't make any sense, right? So I would need to have lambda be multiplied by the identity here for this algebraically to even make sense. So there we go. This is lambda i minus a times v is equal to zero. So I am seeking vector solutions to this expression. This is and this is called a homogeneous linear matrix equation, right? Or vector equation. This is a homogeneous equation because the right hand side is zero. Okay. And it turns out that whether or not this has a solution right is determined by whether or not this thing is invertible right so actually I want the determinant of this matrix lambda I minus a to be equal to zero So I want that. I want the determinant of lambda i minus a to be equal to zero in order to guarantee that this equation has a solution. Because if it doesn't, if the determinant is non-zero here, actually that means that maybe I should say has a non-trivial solution. Technically, if this is invertible, so a homogeneous matrix equation always has a solution um, because the zero vector, if V is equal to the zero vector here, um, uh, that is a solution because a times the zero vector is always the zero vector for any matrix a 
Okay, so technically this always has a solution. What I'm interested though, since I don't consider the zero vector to be an eigenvector for anything, uh, what I'm interested is uh, when v is not the zero vector. And in order for this homogeneous equation to have a non-trivial solution, what is required is that this matrix in question be not invertible. But that means its determinant is equal to zero. What kind of object is this though? What is this? Let's do a quick example. Uh, let A be equal to 3, 2, 2, 3. <clears throat> okay. What is the determinant of lambda i minus A? What is that? Well, first of all, what is lambda times i? This is the number lambda times the identity matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1. So that is lambda, 0, 0, lambda. All right. So what is the determinant of lambda times i? Well, lambda, or sorry, lambda i minus a. Well, lambda i minus a is lambda i, which is lambda, 0, 0, lambda minus a, which is 3, 2, 2, 3, right? <clears throat> Rewriting this as a single matrix, this would be lambda minus 3, 0 minus 2, so it's minus 2 here, 0 minus 2, so that's minus 2 there, lambda minus 3, so that's lambda minus 3 here. So that is what it looks like. So then let me give myself some room here. So then determinant of lambda i minus a is really the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix lambda minus 3 minus 2 minus 2 lambda minus 3. So this is equal to lambda minus 3 times lambda minus 3. This is just the determinant of a 2 by 2. So it's a times b, uh, d minus b times uh, or sorry, minus c times a. So this is a times d minus b times c. <laughs> so this is uh, minus minus 2 times minus 2. So this is equal to, uh, if we FOIL this out, this is uh, lambda squared minus 6 lambda plus 9, all right, plus uh, sorry, no, this is minus 4. E. This is minus 4. Okay. So this is lambda uh, this is lambda squared minus 6 lambda plus 5. So the original question is what kind of object is determinant of lambda i minus a? It is a polynomial. It's a polynomial. For a 2 by 2, it's a degree 2 polynomial, a quadratic. For a 3 by 3, it's a degree 3. For an n by n, it's a degree n polynomial. This polynomial is called the characteristic polynomial. So this is the characteristic polynomial. Of A. Right, where our A we started with is our favorite matrix we've used over and over again here, 3, 2, 2, 3. Okay. So that calls for a definition here. If A is an n by n matrix, then P sub A of Z, which is defined to be the determinant of ZI minus A, is the characteristic polynomial of A. Now what was our goal in finding the characteristic polynomial? Well, if I want the determinant of lambda I minus A to be equal to zero, then what I'm looking for are roots 
of the characteristic polynomial. So if I'm looking for lambda such that the determinant of lambda i minus a is equal to zero, I'm looking for lambda that are roots of the characteristic polynomial. And so I get to the main fact. This is extremely important. This is a triple star fact. Okay, eigenvalues of A are exactly the roots of the characteristic polynomial of A. So these eigenvalues are just the characteristic, the roots of the characteristic polynomial. So let's go back and do that example. If a is 3, 2, 2, 3, we already saw that the characteristic polynomial p sub a of z is, let's just bring it back. This is what we worked out here. So this would be z squared minus 6z plus 5. What are the roots? Well, this factors, right? So this, this, this factors. So how does this factor? 5 and 1, right? So this is z minus 1, z minus 5. So the roots are z equals 1 and 5. So the eigenvalues of a are lambda 1 equals 1 and lambda 2 equals 5. Okay, so those are my eigenvalues. Now, we still have a lot of work to do. We have to figure out how to find eigenvectors okay, associated to each eigenvalue, and we'll get to that. The first thing I wanted to say is generally you would have to take, it would take some effort to compute these things, I'm, uh, the characteristic polynomial, right? You'd have to compute that determinant for a large matrix. That could be really nasty. But for a 2 by 2, so if a is a 2 by 2 matrix, then the characteristic polynomial of A is actually really easy. It's z squared minus the trace of A times z plus the determinant of A. Let's think for a second. Let's see how that works here. What's the determinant of A? 3 times 3, which is 9, minus 4. 9 minus 4 is 5. Yep. Minus the trace here. What's the trace of A? 3 plus 3 is 6, minus 6C. Yep, exactly. So this is a very nice way to save yourself some time in computing those characteristic polynomials. Okay. This also gives you a really nice way of kind of off the top of your head cooking up uh, matrices that have the uh, that have the eigenvalues that you want. Okay, so this is uh, if you see me coming up with things, you know, just off the top of my head that are not in the notes uh, or an example or exercise, then you know this is how I'm doing it. This is how I'm cooking it up. So I encourage you when you're practicing. Um, some of these things to to have a look uh, at this form to make your life easier so that you can actually cook up some examples having the eigenvalues you want. But anyway, um, so we'll continue here uh, tomorrow. Um, we'll start immediately with how to compute eigenvectors and then finally we'll be able to talk about how this all ties together uh, to allow us to solve these these linear systems. So once we're able to find both eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we're almost done. Okay, at that point, it just takes a little, little tiny bit 
of tweaking and we have uh, a general recipe for putting together um, these things. So anyway, that is the plan. Uh, so I will see you all tomorrow.